Well, let's see. Uh, the, the notes are pretty simple this week. You know, for the first week was the one that was you have all these handouts you can bury yourself in. Uh, this week, um, the, there'll be the, you know, five pages of the, the participant notes, and then there's three handouts. So maybe you want to just get yourself set, settled there, tab three, uh, and maybe have the notes in one pile and the handouts in another, or whatever. It, since there's less handouts, maybe that's not... Maybe that's not beneficial for you. Maybe you just want to... Uh, I think the handouts will be more toward the end, you know, toward, toward the um, second half. So maybe you just want to keep them in there. I'm not sure. So, okay. Uh, now, practice part one. We're done with the theory. Now the practice. First thing I, I want to say is uh, that I'm going to teach you some, some things tonight, but... Really, the heart and soul of shepherding, it, there is just full freedom in how, in how you do it. The, the three principles are uh, guarding, okay, guarding, uh, nurturing. I, I, don't, I think I'm going to try to draw grass. I've done water and grass. Because uh, for shepherds, you know, I feel like grass should be in there, you know. Nurturing. And then, you remember what the third one was? Guiding, yeah, guiding, protecting or guarding, nurturing and guiding. So those are the three uh, actions that characterize shepherds. Okay, it's just it's just one gift out of maybe a dozen in the body of Christ. You know, the encouragers they they put courage into people and comfort into to people. You know, uh, the evangelists you know they share the gospel. Uh, the uh, helpers, they help people accomplish tasks that they have to get done their gift of that. Healers bring healing. Shepherds, this is kind of what we do. It's built into the word itself. What a shepherd does for sheep. They, they protect, they nurture, and they give guidance. So those are really the three. And there's just a, to- a total range of freedom for how you, um, how you carry that out. It's getting together with people, and I believe like, Listening and loving, and the Holy Spirit will work these three if it, it, it'll just kind of happen. But yeah, that, that's kind of the center. That's the bullseye of shepherding, is those three. So now, uh, first steps. I'm not sure what all you have on your list, but like first visit, like what I'll do with people if I don't know them is listen to their story. So like that might be like literally probably be your whole first get together with something. It's like, hey, Tell them, you start by telling them some of your story and, you know, um, you know, this isn't a two minute version. This is, this is a little longer one, you know, you're going to have lunch with the person. Hey, this is, you know, so just tell them your story. And then, um, once, once you're done, you know, um, ask them to tell you a little bit about, about their story. Now, depending on the, the person that you're serving this way, if it's your child, obviously you don't need to ask them their life story. You know, you kind of, you kind of have been a part of that. Um, but you know, and, and depending on who the person is, you may already have a strong relationship. When I came here, you know, I'm serving as an official shepherd. So I got all these ones that these are the ones, you know, to care for. So I don't know any of them don't have a relationship with, so it might be a little different in my situation. You may already have relationships with the person that you're entering into a, or you're in a shepherding role with or serving that way. But yeah, that's, that's what I do. Definitely. Um, the, the relationship is the foundation. So, um, but yeah, then in terms of first steps into green pasture, I've got two, two things. One is the first part is out of darkness into light. And these just kind of complement each other. The first is let's get rid of the gunk. And the second part is let's build some strength. Now, by far, 99% of what I do with people is build strength. Help them nurture their relationship with Jesus. Like, that is how they will get stronger. So that's definitely, and even tonight, like, most of the focus and the takeaway that I want you to have for this session will be into strength. But I do think there's value in spending at least a little time on getting some of the gunk out. And there's different philosophies with that. You know, one philosophy is let that happen naturally, which which I appreciate. Teach them how to read the Word, how to spend that time with Jesus, and the Holy Spirit will bring things that need to go to them when it's time for those things to go. And I totally believe in that philosophy too. So, 
having said that, I do think there's value there's value in the front end in if they have some gaping areas where darkness just has a grip. <laughs> you know, um, there can be just incredible value in even just a short uh, uh, helping shepherd them through really what is biblical repentance. It's really not. We're not inventing anything new here. But, you know, and maybe the person, we're shepherds, we're not evangelists. You know, they are, and hopefully whoever shared the gospel, you know, there's that two sides. It's repentance and faith. That's what Jesus said. Repent and believe the good news. The literally first message in this, you know, in the book of Mark, um, some of the other gospels too, Luke, first term. You know, um, uh, and so maybe that we could leave that for the evangelists. Hopefully they already carried that part and we can just help them get strong. But maybe the evangelists didn't. We don't know. And that's like, Knowing, knowing your person. So we're, we're going to just spend a little bit of time on that. Um, also just acknowledging full freedom for how, how you apply that with, with the person that you're in. I think it's good, especially for you guys, to understand that concept and how valuable that is and just to be aware of that, that process. And also, it's, it's also it can be a way of shepherding people as well, shepherding them through repentance because they, they might have heard the gospel. They might have heard the message or whatever, but, you know, how, how was that? what was I supposed to do with like, I, don't, I may not know exactly, even if I understand what you're saying was right, what do I... Yeah, I shared the gospel with a young man this, this past, uh, last week, Thursday. You know, just a very simple bridge illustration. I'm not his pastor. I wasn't shepherd. I was just sharing the gospel. But we got to the repentance step, and he was like, so what do I have to actually, like, do to, to repent? And I was like, well, it's just a change of heart towards your sin, you know? So it happens on the inside, like, you know? And he's like, well, what am I supposed to do? Like, can you give me some? I want to do something, you know? And... And sometimes, you know, they need, they need a little shepherding in, um, you know, different cultures of the world. Have, they have different cultural expressions of the way you do it. And the important thing is the change of heart. But, you know, in Jewish times, they would, they would put on special clothes and throw dust over their heads. You know, that's, that, we don't do that over here. You know, but maybe, uh, maybe American culture, you come down to the altar. Of course, that's not in the Bible either, but that's all right. You know, and you kneel down and, and there's a chorus that plays. And, and you know, you, you get down on your knees and just tell the Lord you're sorry for your sin. And that's kind of our like physical kind of cultural, you know, thing with re- repentance. The Bible, Jesus says repent and to have that change of heart, you know. Um, but, you know, this, this, this kid was very clear. I want something. Give me something tangible to do. And, um, and there's, there's, there's nothing wrong with, wrong with that. Even in the book of James, it, it gives some encouragement, some practical um, steps to take, you know. But uh, so, you know, I just gave him an idea. I said, okay, well, what you could do. Go home, get out a, a sheet of paper, and just write down anything that you know you need to be cleansed of f- from your whole life, that you know you've p- participated in that was hurtful to God. Just write them all down. Take that sheet of paper. Just lay it out in front of the Lord. Just say, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry for, for these things that I've done that have hurt you. Very simple. He said, now that I can do. I can do that. Thank you. <laughs> you know, was that a biblical inspired? No. You can do, you know. But he, he, C.S. Lewis kind of, you know, said something like, God, there's all these p- practical, tangible things in, in, in the Bible and steps that encourage us to do. Partly because God's made us, we're part animal and we're part physical. The idea is we're material. God's, we're not pure spirit. You know, God's made us, but we cry tears. We don't just get sad. Like things happen in our body, you know, and in the, and that those kind of things can, can help us. Some of those actions, tangible actions, can help us get our heart to where we're trying to take our heart. And uh, so, yeah, that was just something from this, this past week um, that, that happened in a very practical way. You know, he, he wanted some help, <laughs> you know, to do that. And that that's a, can be a tender way, a kind way, a, a precious way of shepherding someone through uh, repentance. So let's we'll just talk briefly about that, and then we'll move into... Um, Definitely the core of the night and the part that is my favorite, the shepherding people into light. So first, out of darkness, uh, Ephesians 4. Does somebody have a Bible on them? And could you look up, Sheila, Ephesians 4, uh, 22? I mean, I have it open. Yeah. Go ahead, Scott, if you got it there. Uh, 22, 23. Mm-hmm. Put off your old self. Oh, back, back up to 21, sorry. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus, to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self 
created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. So, super simple. You were taught, put off the old, put on the new. And he uses that same clothing imagery in a lot of his epistles. You were told to get, take the dirty clothes off and put on some of the new clothes, you know. Um, and, and interestingly, you know, uh, he says you were taught. You were taught this. He's writing to a group that was Ephesians. So, you know, they, they had heard the gospel. Paul himself personally had discipled most of them for a couple years. And now he's writing to them. So they're already Christians. They'd been Christians for several years. And some of you, you may, you know, shepherd somebody that's already Christian. It's like, well, do I have to go through this step with them? Well, no, hopefully, as Paul says, they were taught it already. And he just gently is reminding them, hey, you were taught, get rid of this stuff, because that'll hurt your fellowship with Jesus, and put on some of the new stuff. So that's what this is, the, the shepherding people, how to put off the stuff that's going to hurt them if they're going to try to build something new. All right. So, yeah, this, this you know, for, for, for new believers, this, it's the start of a new, a new war, really. A war against darkness. Darkness out without and darkness within. You know, we each have a sarx, a part of us, a sin nature. In Greek, the word is sarx, but it's, it, it's in us. And even when we're saved, we're, it, doesn't, it loses its grip. Its chains of our, over us are broken, but it's still there, raging against us till the day, till the day we die. So we, we have a part inside of us that is bent towards um, darkness. And, um, and it's good for them to be aware of that, not to have a rose-colored you know, view of like, the Christian life and even understand just because you repent of this doesn't mean now you're, you're not going to want to do it ever. Your sark stays the same. <laughs> it's going to pull towards that. You're going to need Jesus um, to, to do this thing. But um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to draw a little picture on the screen. And I've already got the house, so you know what? I'm just going to recycle that and just get rid of these numbers. Now, now Paul there uses the imagery of clothes. Okay, get rid of the dirty clothes, put on the new clothes. I'm going to switch it to house. Okay, even Paul himself, he's always mixing his metaphors, so I feel I feel I have a license to do this. In fact, um, Sheila, do you have yours open? He's she shut his down. Go ahead and read. He's going to actually give them, a, in, in the verses right after that, he's going to give just some lists, a simple list of like the common sins that need to be thrown off. If they're in your life and they have a grip, hey, it's just got to go. And, you know, you, you see that he lists some of those stealing and lying and grieving. But now I want you to, to see, he switches his metaphor in verse 27 and he says something very interesting. Another motivation, why you want to get rid of the gunk at the front end of the thing. Here, and read that verse. Uh, and do not give the devil a foothold. Yes. Now, do you see that? Now, we can skip this part and just let me help them nurture their relationship with Jesus. But these, these actions, the evil that they're ongoingly engaged in, th- those, any, any form of sin that we're engaged in, a- another metaphor is you're, you're opening a door. Or, now, this is a window, so I guess the door might be on the side. But, but you, you know, let's say you're, engaged in, in, you're actively engaged in stealing. Okay, now you come to Christ. That... That activity, let's, let me give some more rooms to the house, even though I know this, that you don't, you know, it's more of a, this isn't the best drawing. But let's just say, I don't know how this would work with a window coming because the, the floor is, um, but, okay. You know, and, and you guys have heard that, that um, maybe heard of that, it's a classic little booklet, My Heart, Christ's Home. You heard that, that one? It's like the idea of Jesus coming into me and my heart has all these different rooms. And slowly over the years, I let him. He gently comes, goes into the rooms, and he wants to go in all the rooms. And we all have certain rooms we want to hide from him initially. You, you know that imagery? Yeah, it's a beautiful little book. I think it's a, it's a classic, maybe in the 1800s, on my heart, Christ's home. But yeah, Jesus, Jesus is the only one who can be our Lord and not destroy us. Like, he is the only truly good master we could have for our life. Any other master, including ourselves, we will destroy ourselves. And so, you know, he, he wants to come in and uh, touch every room and be Lord in, in every room. Uh, Colossians 3.15, but in your, or 1 Peter 3.15, but in your hearts, set apart Jesus as Lord. And, uh, but, but that verse, yeah, to get, get rid of the gunk, when we're engaged in evil, who are we inviting to come in and get 
influence. Yeah, yeah. It and it, and I, it's military. You know, it's military imagery. Actually, on a battlefield, some spots are better spots to wage war against. You know, you might have a high point, and the sniper gets up there, and then it's hard to kick him out once he gets in. And the idea is, you know, our lives are like that. And if we engage in some form of evil unrepentantly, you know, we're engaged in this. That then darkness comes in, and it and it. Uh, yeah, a foothold, which, you know, it's, it's a, I'm, I'm drawing a little padlock there, but it's a, he's got some influence in that area. He's got some strength that, that he, he's got, you know, and maybe it's another area that they've got going on over here. And, uh, you know, um, uh, I'm going to draw a little, another little padlock there. Foothold, you know, uh, a grip, almost like a foot in the door, you know, once you get that foot in the door... You know, that's, that's, that's hard. I remember as little kids, you know, even if the, a little sibling gets, you're trying to get in and they've got their, their foot in the door, you know, it's hard to, even a little kid, they got those rubber feet in there and boy, you can't, it's hard to get them out. And that's kind of the analogy to, that he says, you know, you're, you baby Christians there in Ephesus, hey, you got to get, put off the bad and put on the good because, you know, if you don't, darkness can get influence into your life. And God doesn't want that. Especially now we're going to, you know, we're, the goal is to help them build fellowship with Jesus. And, of course, darkness and light, how do they mix? <laughs> yeah, what Paul says, what fellowship has light with darkness? Yeah, if Jesus is going to come in and do his work inside all these rooms, and yet darkness has a foothold in some of those rooms, you know, that's, gonna, that's not going to... Um, and so there's some benefit, you know, and you could just say, I'm just going to let them encounter those. When they get to those passages of scripture, they'll realize, you know, and, um, and then they'll deal with it there. But I think there's some value even in just, just um, I think there's value in being aware of these dynamics and even um, just encouraging the, the person that you're shepherding to be aware of them and be sure that they get these doors closed, you know, close these windows so you can build fellowship with Jesus. Otherwise, in some ways, we'll be beating our head against the wall because you're going to be trying to build fellowship with Jesus and darkness still got a grip, you know, and you don't want to do that. You want them to experience the growth. So have them, have them close all those doors, close any windows, get, get the gunk out. You could use another analogy of, of well, we're going to be renovating this house and, and Jesus is going to come in and put brand new carpet and new furniture and it's like a full reno. Well, but... You know, let's say you got a leaky roof. You know, well, Jesus can come in and do some things, but if you don't take care of that leaky roof, you know what I mean? You're you're gonna wreck all that new furniture you put in. You know, so the idea is let's seal things up here. Let's let's kick darkness out and kind of restore the the integrity of the house, and then we'll we'll be working with what Jesus is trying to do right from the right from the beginning as opposed to working again. Does that make sense? Yes. So, okay. Well, well, how do you do this? You know, um, there's, there's lots of different um, ways you could do this with the person. And that's, you know, de- depending on where they're at spiritually. Um, I've got something that, that I put together maybe about a year ago and my aunt helped me with it. Um, this is a, it's called, I call it the, the red detox binder. And I, I've only done something like this once, once but um, uh, when, when I was going to get married, my aunt said, Solomon, before you get married, let me encourage you to just walk through this little detox process. He's like, because you've got some stuff in your f- family that you don't know about that we haven't told you about and some bad stuff in marriages and some gunk that's in your past, you know, and, and you may not have given any footholds to darkness in those areas as you're starting off, but you may have, you don't, you know. Just walk through this, and she just encouraged me. I don't want to do it. I'm getting married here. I don't want to, you know. But she gave me this. It was, called, it was a little packet called Restoring the Foundations, and it just bounced through different areas. Just do a system check. Just do a system check. You know, this one okay? Yeah, okay. That one okay? No. If it's not, lay it open in front of God. God, forgive me for, for doing this. I want you to close any doors I've opened in there. In Jesus' name. And remember, anything put on the blood of Jesus gets cleansed. And if darkness has a grip in there, it don't anymore after you say in Jesus' name, if it was sincere. It's a, it's a simple act that's incredibly powerful, and it's not painful. You know, so um, 
So she just encouraged me to walk through it, and I did. It was a big old th thing, and I walked through it all. And uh, it was a whole afternoon. I remember just going to the park for the afternoon and walking through this thing and just praying through this thing. And, um, you know, it was t a little tiring emotionally because um, it was a big, big one. Mine's only eight, but hers was big. But I tell you what, I went home feeling like a million bucks. Like you could almost tangibly feel, felt freer. I felt just like clean. Like there was nothing... Nothing hidden between me and the Lord now. I mean, you know, and, and what a great way to start the Christian life. Now I want to stay there, <laughs> you know, but what a great first step to learn to, to learn to just be open with the Lord, you know. And, and of course, James says we all stumble in many ways. And once they've repented, they're going to stumble again. But that's when you confess and you get, you get clean. But, but it's great to have just a first initial cleansing. And then, and then it's on your radar screen, you know, to be honest with the Lord. And, and, um, and, and instead of getting off... Instead of starting off on the, on the wrong foot where you start off learning to hide things and you just build a practice of hiding things from Jesus, you know, it's not going to serve you well. So, um, so my aunt and I and another guy, um, a counselor, um, put this together. Um, this is eight uh, of probably the most common areas where people let darkness get a grip on them. It's not, you know, I'd say it's not inspired because we put this together, but it's, it's definitely from the New Testament and we got a lot of verses. But one is bitterness. Another is chasing other kingdoms outside of God. So somebody might, you know, come to you and they're going to start nurturing the relationship with Jesus, but they got some like idols in their life. Like their thing is their career. Like they just want to get ahead and be like, you know, or like get a lot of money. Like that's their thing. And I mean, they, they can, you can beat your head against a wall trying to fellowship with Jesus when you haven't taken care of that at the initial, you know what I mean? And uh, rebellion. Arrogance or pride, that was a really, that one, that one was good for me. <laughs> you know, man. And then it gets, it's got outward pride versus inward pride, like mulling on your pain. You know, introverts have different versions of pride than arrogant, or than extroverts. That was a good one. Um, this one, it's not sin, but, you know, darkness can get a grip in our lives based on what other people do to us that it hurts us. And abuse is very common. It's so common. And so this is just an extra boost of healing from abuse. And my aunt works with abuse survivors. That's like her, her whole ministry. Um, and my uncle had his, his doctorate in ministry, you know, and went to Dallas. And he, he, she worked with him. And so they went through this and just overhauled it. And, and most of the good stuff there comes straight from, from her. Um, sexual moral failure. You know, almost everybody that starts off the Christian life, they got something in that category. And they might want to just hide that from the Lord too. Now, how about you don't? How about you just get that clean right from the beginning and start fresh and feel what freedom and, and being clean feels like, you know? Um, occult activities and then lying, stealing, and other known sins. And what I have, I, there's different ways I do this um, depending on what they want. I, I introduce them to it and I say, you know what? You take this home and just skim through the first page on each of them and decide, do I need to read through this one? and process it or no. And if you don't need to, then you move on from that. Normally people only have two or three that are really relevant to them. And those are the ones that, that you walk through. But each of them just has, each of them starts with a definition and a verse. And then they each have a little story. Well, this one's got more than that. There. A little testimony. It's just a one-page story of somebody that really had, this was, this was an area where darkness really had a grip. You know, and uh, it's, it's a cool story. It's, they're, they're not outdated in old um then some practical steps for dealing with it and then all of them do this simple thing they do um step one get it out in the open just bring lay it in front of the lord here it is <laughs> i've been step uh, step two bring it to the lord so step one is get it out in the open step two is just bring it straight to the lord and ask him to touch it ask him to clean it, ask him to put his hand on it and some of them have a follow-up steps um, bitterness has follow-up steps because it's, you know, it's more than just a prayer. There's going to be some process. The abuse, there's a follow-up steps. You know, you can just put a Band-Aid on that and things are going to be all better. But, but uh, some of the other ones, you know, um, there might have a page of follow-up steps. But the, the first step is just um, get it out in the open. And number two, bring it to the, bring it to the Lord. You know, and, and uh, the get it out in the open one, it's great for them to look through. Like if they, if they think that might be something for them, this is really, it's really nice because it, they each have a like a um, like a checklist, and oh, someone, some young adult used this, and I didn't put a new one in there, so this this has been used. Sorry, but yeah, it'll be identifying pride, and it'll give you like a little checklist. Checklist, okay, or occult activities will give you 
a checklist because they might not know what's an occult activity. So after the story, it'll give you the get it out in the open is is it'll just give you a list of different forms, you know, um, seances, you know, if you're participating in seances, witchcraft, voodoo. A one young adult, you know, he got to got to that one and was like, you know, it was like contacting other spirits and that thing. He was like, I mean, I can't. That's bad to do. Like, I was like, yeah, yeah. If you're gonna fellowship with Jesus, he doesn't want you to have other fellowship with any of the other spirits out there. Just news to him. He was like, whoa, I gotta stop that. Then you know, I was like, yep, yeah. So you know what I mean? Just just a just a one code to walk through it and see and see what the Holy Spirit brings to mind because he may not even know, you know. And here. This this one was he was going to the cemetery, you know, and doing little seances or whatnot, doing little. But he didn't he didn't realize that you think you think oh my goodness you must know this. But he, he hadn't grown up in in being exposed to a lot of godly counsel and teaching. People don't always come from a Christian background where they know everything, and the culture is so it's so dark. You know what I mean? There's this, there's plenty of things they might not know if they didn't come from a Christian background. So you can you can give it to him, just have him walk, you know, take it home. Um, sk- skim through the first page, and if you need to camp out any, camp out, process it, bring the binder, take the pages out that you use, and bring it back to me. You know, that's what I have them do. If you use any, I tell them, um, take that. If you, if you use any of the pages, take that whole section out. Just take it out and bring it, bring it back to me with that section gone. I just refilled. Uh, so this has been in, in several people. I've used this, this one. And uh, um, others, I've had guys say, I want you to do it with me. And that's a little awkward for me, but I've done it. You know, I've kind of grown into that. That's, you know, I've had older, older, you know, guys that are, you know, 26, 30, that kind of just, you know, just a little, you're not used to talking to God about anything, you know, and can you help me with this? And, and, uh, um, so, you know, it depends on the person and what their, their preference is, but the idea is we're shepherding them. Um, this is a way of serving them. It's a way of loving on them. It's a way of helping them get the gunk out. So that then you can build the strength and have a good, clean, solid foundation you're starting with. Make sure the roof is on the house and there's no, no doors open for darkness to get a foothold. So, um, any questions on that on that part? I would have rather had that than the 36 pages on, then the, on the Greek. Oh Sorry. yeah, no, no, yeah, <laughs> academic, yeah, yep. That's well, that's week two versus week three. Yep, yep. And I've got a couple of these. I mean, I, I read through maybe. Oh this my goodness, like... it's thick. Yeah, yeah. Reference. Those are reference. Reference only. <laughs> but yeah, definitely, it's super practical. Do you have like a pamphlet or a miniature version of this? Yeah. No, I mean no. It's just eight. It's Is eight that categories. To, um, I mean, there's numerous like inner healing type ministries. Possi- Do you know if possibly. it's similar to like deal with it or encountering God or? You know, I don't. I, it's very okay. simple. It's just the eight categories. Here's what the Bible says. Here's like a checklist of different ones, like see, and then like, some prayers. You know, the, I would like to look at that. Yeah, absolutely. I I, I know some, from the other session, some some people asked for it. I I one young adult has one right now. Like if you, I think I, I only have. I would, pay to, I, had, I would pay to get it printed. If you yeah, know. that's what, what I need to do is. I'll go get copies. It's hey, I, I would definitely do it. Yeah, I need to have I need to have a bunch of copies. I really wasn't ready for for this and I've had people ask for it. You know, it, it's a tool that's great to to have. I made three of them initially, you know, and I'm down to one now because <laughs> you know I give them out and then you know and I say take your time on it. Just yeah. sometime when you got an afternoon, walk walk through it and yeah. when you're done, take out those ones and bring it back to me. So um, yeah, at some point I will get some more and I will try to. Or, or if you want to take, I, I need to clean out the pride one, clearly. I mean, you know, walk yeah, through and make sure that that one, one yeah. So, all right, this is my favorite, like, segment out of this night, and this night is my favorite of all the four nights. So, uh, yeah, this this part 
complements the last part, you know, which is right there in the passage. You were taught there's there's some things, a list of things, not a big list. There's a list of things that gotta go, and now and and there's there's things to put on too, and uh, this is so this is the flip side out of darkness into light, and uh, let's let's draw near. Okay, let's let's throw off some things and let's draw near to Christ. This is shepherding people into strength. Okay, shepherding people into strength. Now. The beautiful thing about this is, 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 it's almost, it's almost scandalously simple. Like, to, and, and I mean, like, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna look at John 15, and it's, it's a paragraph about this, this big, but I'm telling you guys, I would take that little passage from the lips of Jesus over, and I've had good, good Bible college education. You know, I've had good teachers of Saturn, good training. I would take that little paragraph of Jesus over over a hundred books on spiritual formation from Barnes and Noble. You know, a hundred self help books on bettering yourself spiritually, you know, and even the Christian ones, you know, Zondervan Press. I, I would I would take John fifteen. You know, it almost it's so easy to accuse Jesus even in our minds like there's there can be this tendency to think like like this teacher has like a PhD and he fills conference halls he he has great reviews on Amazon like he must know what he's talking about spiritual health you know but like Jesus I mean it's Jesus right like that was 2000 years ago like maybe it wasn't t- quite up to date you know what I mean like are we getting, like who wants to go to a conference on John 15. Like, you're not, you don't want to go to a conference on John. You want to go to like a conference on like experiencing the keys to unlocking your spiritual life or something like that. I'm trying to do all the buzzwords, you know, like you'll sell books. Use the word unlock, use the word key, use the word experiencing. Like, Christians go for that stuff, you know what I mean? And, and have a great cover graphic and whatnot, you know, and, and, um, have really amazing stories, you know, um, but I, I'm just telling you, I think like, I'll take Jesus over any human author any day. And the older I get, the best that I find in Christian, and learn from Christian teachers. God's given them to the church. Um, I don't want to be against them. I'm literally doing that right now. Like, I'm teaching, you know? So, like, learn from them. God's gifted them. But always keep Jesus, like, here and everybody else here. And what I found is the best of what, when somebody, like, really unlocks something, like, whoa, that was life-changing. Then, like, a year later, I'll, like, find that it was in Philippians chapter four or something like that. It was like, oh, I was there the whole time. Like, oh, like, you know, and so after seeing that happen so many times, I'm just like, I think all the treasures are in that book. Um, I think if you, and maybe that's what the best of Christian teaching, you're pointing, you're unpacking something that's probably in that book that I didn't see before. And that's where the, the treasure is. And this passage, guys, is the treasure of treasures when it comes to shepherding people. So we're going to look at it. And I'm going to, this is the first time I'm going to give you homework. So you need a pen for this part. If you, don't, if you don't have one, I can get one for you. Does anybody need one? Yeah, I've got a little thing right here. And you do need a blank sheet, so you can just turn over any of your... Yeah, they're pretty much all blank. I just did one side. You need one? Oh, no, you don't. Does anybody need one? No, you guys all have it. Okay. Joanne, I saw your hand go up. Oh, I think I'm about 12 in the first Oh, so you're... Okay, you've got... Yeah. So what we're going to do here is we're going to turn to John 15 in some way, shape, or form. You can share with your neighbor if you don't have a Bible. Uh, and we're going to, uh, I want you to write down the three ifs. He's going to make three if statements and then three ridiculous promises that we're going to be prone to think, Jesus, come on now. Come on, Jesus. Don't oversimplify things. It can't be that simple, Jesus. Like, how simplistic can you be? You know, like... He's the king, and he seems to think these three practices can provide the three things he promises, and they're incredible promises we're going to look at. First, I want you to find the practices that he commends to a baby Christian, midlife Christian, old Christian. Three ifs. Starts with uh, John 15, verse 5, where he says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. So the three ifs will come between verses 5 and 10, and that's all. Um, one of the ifs, you don't, just do the ifs that have to do with us, if you. 
there's one if about if Jesus does this, I'm pretty sure Jesus is going to fulfill his part. So just so there's technically four ifs, but one of them is on Jesus. Just do the three ifs that, that will apply to the person you're shepherding and to yourself. Okay, let's do this. Let's do this. We're gonna help each other here. All right. So, who got the first? Who got the first one? Scott, what was the first one you got? If you do not abide in him. If you do not. What you say? If you do not abide in him. If you do not abide in him. Okay, that that's that's the negative one. Yep. So, good. Okay, so the first, yes, the very first one would be if, if you do. Or in his translation, so what's your translation? Yes. Standard. Okay, so yours is abide. Okay, so. Should I use a different standard translation? No, uh-uh. No, that's great. If you uh, remain or abide uh, in me. Okay. Well, that's my second one. Okay, so you took the, the negative one, yes. So you, sh- you should have one more active one to find. Scott did. All right. Now, whose translation has remain and who's got abide? Okay. The, the, it doesn't really matter. You know, what, the, the, what it means is, is stay like this with. And in fact, I'm going to use this opportunity to get my grapevine. So I'll be right back. Okay, okay. Now this thing has seen better days. You know, I I find a couple more grapes in my filing cabinet every year. You know, so so the whatever word we use for abide or remain, it's fine. But the the point is, this is us. This part's Jesus. This part has to stay connected with this part. Okay, stay in touch with, remain in, abide in. If it gets disconnected, which it dies, yeah. So that's the first part. If you if you just stay, however you would say that in English, if you stay uh, connected to me, it might be a good way to say it. We don't really use the word abide anymore. Even remain doesn't sound quite natural, but it's okay if you remain in me. Um, but okay, that's the first one. If you stay in touch with, stay connected with me, what was the second one that we got? Sheila, what'd you get? First, you second. My Oop, that's actually the third, oh, one. The third one. Yep, okay. that's the third. What about the, before that? In between those two. Oh, my word turning yeah, it's kind of oh, hidden because yeah. it's on the tail end of the clause. He said, if, if, if I remain in you. 
and my words. So if Jesus' words remain or abide in us. Ooh, this was, if, if we remain in him, and this one is his words uh, remain in us. Very interesting. Okay. And again, same word is stay in touch with, stay connected with my words. Okay, and what's the third one? Which, which we got? We got, yeah, if you obey. You obey my commands. Not the, not the commands of Moses. Okay. Oh, the old covenant is not active anymore. My commands, the commands that came off the lips of Jesus, which First John says are not burdensome. In fact, it's the more we obey them, we find ourselves doing things like, cast all your anxieties on me because I care for you. That's a command. <laughs> Let peace be what rules in your heart. A command. These are burden-relieving commands. All of Jesus' commands produce peace and strength, and none of them put burdens on us. So those are the three. Yeah, and then uh, uh, we've got these ridiculous We've got these ridiculous promises that, that are attached to them. We'll look at the promises briefly. And then for the remainder of the time, we're going to come back and just unpack these three. Because I want you guys to understand these three crystal clear. So that way, anybody that you're shepherding can understand them. Because these, not to, not to use the word magic, but these are where the magic's at. These are where Jesus thinks these practices. It's not magic. We're going to explain what it is. It's a relationship. But he thinks these three practices are sufficient to accomplish the promises he gives. So let's look at the promise. What's the first promise? If you, if you remain or abide in me, what, what does he say for that one? You bear much fruit. You, you, yeah, and, and you, what was it? Okay, I'm going to do that in red, yeah. I think this is the one. Ah. Yeah. Grow much fruit. You see that? This Christian that you're shepherding, they will grow a whole lot of fruit. Fruit will be popping out of their life. You see that? You'll grow some fruit. What did he say? Much. A lot. Incredible. That's just the first one. I mean, you want them to get fruitful, right? Great news. You don't need a doctorate. You don't have to like read a 100-page spiritual formation book to help someone. All you got to do is teach them to abide in Jesus, whatever that means. We're going to unpack that. But, and look at that. They're going to grow a whole lot of fruit. Whatever God wants to accomplish through their life, it's going to come to fruition. Whatever's most on his heart, whatever he's most designed for them to do in the body of Christ, that fruit's going to come out. It might take some time, but it's going to come out. It's going to be beautiful. And it's going to be a lot of it. It's an incredible promise. Second one, just as incredible. If my words stay in, in you, what's the promise for that one? It's amazing. It's just amazing. All of these. Yep, go ahead, Isabella. You can share. Oh, okay. Um, that you may bear much fruit and so prove yourselves to be my disciples. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to put the word yes. <laughs> to summarize. This is amazing. Bad, right? This is an amazing one. Now, uh, now, obviously, you know, the theologians, and I'm an exegete, professional exegete, that was my training, wasn't trained in pastoring until now I am, but, you know, and we're going to say, okay, 1 John 5 says you got to ask, you have to you know, give some other qualifications. James says it has to be with faith. 1 John it has to be according to his will. You know, it's not that I'm going to want that 10-speed bike, and I believe it, Lord, claim it. You know what I mean? It has, so, and yes, we have those, we have those, and they're there. However, at this point, he doesn't, and yes, those qualifications are there, and they're inspired by Jesus. But at this point, we can give all those qualifications and we can drain the, the life out of what is actually being said here, which is amazing. The way it hits you when you're a teenager and you're like, whoa, really? Yeah, there's a, Jesus didn't feel the need to qualify. He was like, I'm going to later, I'll, I'll guide you into that. I, guide you. I just want you to understand this. And the this is this. So putting all that theology of those qualifiers without watering down what he's saying, I think what he says is this. If you're the kind of person that you genuinely try to listen to my words, like you're the kind of person, you're trying to get my words sticking in you, then when you talk, you can know for sure that I'm listening. And not only that, that my default answer to you 
will be yes. Think about that. That's what he's saying. His default stance to the prayers, good requests from his kids, is yes. And then let me say, add to that because I'm like, oh, that's not true. Yeah. And we got the other qualifiers in New Testament, right? So what I, I like to envision, it, think of it like this. Unless he has some reason for it to be no, his default answer will be yes. His answer is yes. That, that is what it means for his default to be yes. Unless there's some reason that has to be a no, his answer is going to be a yes. That's what I mean when I say his default answer is yes. So you have to understand that. He's trying to show us something about his heart. Do you see it in the text or am I making it up? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it almost seems stronger in the text, doesn't it? <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, go ahead. I, and this is kind of more of like to your um, word origin okay. side. So, yeah, yeah. But I'm you know, kind of looking at this and I'm re- reminded of something I looked at before. And it's the next verse talks about the whole, what the abiding here really is referring to. Okay. Uh, because... As the Father has loved me, so I love you. Abide in my love. And so then in this verse 7, abide in me and my word in you, he's talking about the intimacy of the relationship with God. Mm. And so it's not just like part of being here and following rules and doing this stuff, but being close, being personal with God. Well, that was the first one. You staying right. in touch. Yep. Yep. And, and Absolutely. It's in so the context. It ties them both together yep. in the same context. Yep. That. It's definitely in the context of a relationship. Yep. But the promise is still the same. Yes, and let <laughs> let it hit you, and let it let it <laughs> let it soak in. It's it is amazing, and let it. That's what you know. That someone that you're shepherding when they they learn this is good. It's good to to learn this. That when you're asking the Lord for something good, you know, um, I, so many prayers I've asked for good things. God, help me grow in patience. Help me grow in love. It's like they've all been answered. They've all been answered. I can't think of one that He hasn't. You know, a good. Rec- and sometimes you know it's a wait. In terms of specific things you're asking for, sometimes it, it's a no. But if it's a no, it's because he has a reason for it to be. His default answer to good requests from his children mm-hmm. is yes. And that's good. And he tells a whole parable about that at a different point in time, you know. Some kid asks his dad for bread. He, he can give him bread, you know. He can be like, nah, you, you, ate, you ate last week, you know. So, well, all right. Third one, if you obey my commands, and let's just briefly on this promise, and then we're going to unpack these three. If you obey my commands, what does, what does he say? You will remain in love. Yes. You remain in my love. The Saturday session, somebody brought up uh, John 4, 14, 21. Flip back to that because it was such a good reference. It's just in the previous, you know, left side of your page. John fourteen twenty one, very similar thing. If you obey my commands, he gives a couple promises. What's it say there? You see that? My, my, the one who, 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 if you keep my commands, you're the kind of person that loves me. The person that loves me, my father will love him, and I myself will love him. And then what was that final one? I will manifest myself. I will make, I think NIV says I will reveal. I will yeah, manifest, reveal myself. And, um, and the idea is that the reveal means that I'll show things about myself to you. There's deeper self-disclosure. For this kind of person, Jesus doesn't give all of Himself to every Christian. Okay, He's He's kind of like us relationally. All right, He doesn't give the whole everything just to everybody, no matter what. You know, there's there's deeper. I'm sure Eric gives gives a deeper part of Himself to to Jenny, and and then a deeper part of Himself to some of His friends. Then and then there's other circles of friends. And, you, know, you know, and and Jesus is the same way, apparently. He, otherwise, the promise means nothing. <laughs> Because it applies to everybody. No, he's saying here it applies to the person that obeys me. There's a special kind of revealing. Of course, some things you know shows to everybody, but but some things are just for those that are that are seeking to obey because they love him. Yeah, incredible promise. I, I would say that this summary way to say that in English, if he's promising greater love and greater self disclosure of himself, we have a great way to say that in English. It's a greater intimacy. That's his promise. I'll go a little deeper with you. A little deeper kind of love. And a little deeper kind of me showing parts of myself to you. you know, that's, that's a picture of intimacy. That's a precious thing. And he's offering it to the person that obeys. So very interesting thing. 
Um, you know, and of course, you know, the thing comes up, well, doesn't Jesus love everybody? So why is he saying, if you obey me, you'll stay in my love? He doesn't, he doesn't say necessarily, if you, if you obey me, he, here in John 15, you know, I will love you if you obey me. That's how he says, he already loves us. What does he say? If you obey me, you'll stay. You'll remain in my love. And I, I, uh, I give the analogy of, of if I'm holding my little girl right here in my arms, like right next to me, she's right, she's got my arm around her, she can feel it, you know, it's warm. She's like, Daddy, I want to go and play with the matches, you know, and she's walking. She's walking over and she's playing with the matches, you know, or she's playing in the spiritual mud, doing something. Do I still love her? Absolutely. Absolutely. Is she abiding in my love, though? Now she's way over there. She can't even feel it, probably. She comes back, crawls up on the chair again. Hey, now she's abiding in my love. You see that? So it's, a, it's it, there in John 15, it's, it's the experience that they have of your love. And so the, the person that obeys, he says in, in John 15, they'll, 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 have a, they'll be staying in my love. They have a, a, a fresher experience with my love than someone who's not. An ongoing experience of my love. Um, the other thing I'll say about God's love is sometimes in theological circles, people get uncomfortable with some a lot that comes out of the mouth of Jesus and they basically just explain it away. So, you know, God loves everybody equally, right? Yes. However, there's different other verses that explain that his love is textured and nuanced just as ours is. So for instance, D.A. Carson, you guys know who D.A. Carson is? Uh, Deerfield, Trinity, probably probably one of the, you know, in terms of names that you might know at Trinity. Um, probably, probably one of the most reputable New Testament scholars of, of this generation, I, I would say D.A. Carson is. So uh, let's see. Uh, he wrote a book called The Five Loves of God. And love one is, he calls it his salvific love, salvation stance love. This is love that goes to the whole world. He has a certain amount of love, a quality of love that he longs for everybody to be saved. And it goes to everybody. And this is the Romans uh, 5, 8. And while we were yet sinners, God demonstrated his love for us. It's a, there's no obedience in that love. There's no is obedience that, whatsoever. Is that agape? Is that like the... It is, yeah, but, but almost all of them, almost all of them are agape. Yeah, almost all of them are because agape. Like, so it's not so much. It's just like the same like word. A brotherly, like a close, like because it, it's just. I think love. But there's no the English language is just so bland. Yeah. When it comes to... But but we talk like this too. We we do. You know, with with love, we have a different kind of love for. I would say I have a different kind of love for Amanda. You know what I mean? Than I do for any other woman and my, than my mother. You know what I mean? But I still use the word love. But, but yeah, and, and, and this is the same way with this word agape. You have to look at the theology and the context. But So Carson would say that's the salvation love. That's the salvific stance love, love number one. And then there's a special kind of love that he has for um, people that are vulnerable and in need and broken. And you see that all through the Old Testament. He's a special father of the followers. What's a father of everybody? But why would he say the followers? Because there's a special part of his heart that's like drawn toward them. You know what I mean? And so there's special parts of his heart, special parts. It's all love. But special parts for one. And then there's a special kind of love for his children. Once they become adopted into his family, then love number one turns into, it adds onto it another layer. Now now you're my kid. And not everybody's my kid. So not everybody gets level, that, that I don't want to call it level, but it's a different texture of the love, you know? Mm-hmm. And, um, and so, so why, if we have all this in, in human relationships, you know, we have all this texture. And, you know, you know of course, love is unconditional. Well, level, level one is unconditional. <laughs> You know what I mean? But in, in even, even once you're in his family, even love three, level, level three, there's more. There's more love for the obedient child and for the one who's always running off and breaking your heart. And that's not God being mean. That's him being even better than we are, but his love is not flatter than ours is. Because everybody in this room, I'm sure you've, you have love for somebody who, who, you know what I mean? They break your heart a lot. And, and if they didn't, boy, it would... It would Change the flavor of the feeling of your love for, for that person. And if you have a rebellious child, you know what I'm talking about there because there, there's, a, um, there's, there's a different flavor of love. When, when, my little, when, my, when my nine-year-old 
is pushing Amanda's buttons. Okay, and he knows how to push him. Do I stop loving him? No, he's still my kid, I still love him. But I have a whole group of other feelings I'm feeling in those moments as well, right? And so, well, we don't, we don't, sometimes we don't give God that freedom. Well, he can't do that because he promised he's the same. Well, okay, how flat does God have to be in his love? And we're not even that flat, you know what I mean? And God, God has, just as we do, hatred sometimes for people that are perpetrating evil against the vulnerable. Oh, he still has love, number one, toward that person. But he also has uh, some experience of, of hatred. If we're going to allow him to disclose himself and his own feelings rather than tell God how he has to feel at all times, if we let him speak, he said, yeah. And so, so God actually has some, there's some people right now all over the world for whom God has both a combination of some negative feelings toward them and also love for them at the same time. That's how textured and, and rich he is. And, and I'm sure probably you, all of you have someone in your life too that it's the same thing. You have someone that you generally have feelings of anger towards, and yet you definitely love them. And sometimes that's the hardest um, flavor of love of all. But at any rate, not to get, uh, just, that was just a little, that was, you know, theology corner there. But the, the, the principle here is, if the child, if, if, a, if a believer, one of God's child obeys, oh, there's a special kind of love that just rushes towards them in God's heart. And they'll have a fresher experience, a richer experience of that love um, than, than one who doesn't. So amazing, three amazing promises from the king. I grow a lot of fruit. When you talk, I will listen, and my default answer will be yes. And there will be a special part of my heart that I showed you, and a special side of my love that will just lavish on top of you. And they're right there, just these three practices. So, okay, now we're going we're gonna to unpack these three. And um, this is the core of the night. These, these three, we've already done the work to get them on the board. You guys saw them there. I wanted you guys to see them for yourself. It's not me, you know, giving you secret wisdom or something. This is, this is there. Jesus said it. It's right there on the page. You know, these three. These are precious to me. So uh, I think at this point, I will direct you to the tab that you have. Uh, tab 8, which is has the vine. And all the answers are, are there. That's why I didn't want you guys to see that. And I got even the promises written in. So let's, uh, let me pull that open there. Look at that first page. All right. I suppose I could put it up here too, but you guys got it there in front of you. The, the point of this one, that first page, we don't know anything about growing grapes anymore. And so whenever I'm teaching someone the John 15 principles, and I do, this is the core of any of my get-togethers, any of the young adults, they, they probably know John 15 ad nauseum. They're like, oh, don't talk about the vine anymore, Pastor Solomon. Like, I'm so sick of the dang vine. You know, yeah, you're going to be sick of the vine with me. That's, like the, that's, that's all we talk about. How is it going? How are these three principles going? Are you about well, why I show them this is because they don't ever, they're not going to go out to, you know, drive through McChesney Park and see, uh, you know, a vineyard and, you know, and be like, have a, let's have time. And, and they live in a vending machine generation, you know, where you push a button and you get what you want out of the machine. Okay, that's not how grapes work. Okay. And so I don't want you to get disillusioned because this first promise is if you learn how to buy them, you're going to grow a lot of fruit. I want you to understand how fruit grows. Fruit takes years. If you're doing everything perfectly fine, you'll see nothing. No visible changes in your life. If you're doing everything right, okay? That's an important principle for them to, to learn. And, and that's, that's, the, that's the vine there. You see that first year, what, spring, summer, that first spring, summer? It's like nothing, man. This Jesus stuff doesn't work. You know, if they don't learn this, you know, this Jesus stuff doesn't work. They said there'd be fruit. It's been a year. I got nothing different, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm going to try Buddhism, you know. Well, maybe hang in a little, maybe research what grapes, how grapes grow a little bit, you know, before you bail there. Okay, year number two, winter pruning, summer, 
You got a little bit, and then it disappears there. <laughs> it's like, what were you doing, Jesus? And that was all gone. I thought I had something there. Well, now you're really thinking this is a psychosomatic religion, you know, and these people must work themselves in a frenzy because I don't see nothing growing on in my life. And, you know, and you're wondering, you're all kinds of, you know, you're, maybe there's some other books i got to read, you know, and you're, you're going to christianbookdistributor.com trying to find the secrets here, you know. Well, there's not a secret. Fruit takes time, okay? All right, summer then, look at that. Summer year three, you get a whole crop. <laughs> and then it gets pruned all off again. <laughs> That's just how it works, you know, and this is so common, you know, to, to people that would have been around at that time in that culture, but just good to show them that, okay, there's a rhythm. There's a rhythm to this thing, and there's a pruning rhythm, there's a dormancy ry- rhythm, and there's a, this thing called time. Well, and that's really the only point of page one. You can go over to page two, and that's the one that's got all the answers. Here, you stick in me, three promises. Oh, we didn't even look at the purpose. Verse 11, I mean, as if those three weren't good enough. Look at verse 11. He summarizes the entire passage. So the reason I'm teaching you these three vine principles is as this. I'm the kind of being that I care about your joy. There are some gods that have been served by men and that still are served by men who don't give a rip about humans growing in joy. They want you to be submissive. Okay? And they will hammer in their God and you're not. And you're there to serve at their beck and call. And if you get burned out in the process, well, that's collateral damage. Not this king. The intent behind every one of his commands is not so we get something done for him. It's so that we grow in joy. And he wants our joy to grow full. He's a good king. Yeah. All right, so let's, uh, now i got to rotate the other way there, page three. I like that graphic because, you know, it shows them Jesus is the main part and they're the dangly. You know, anytime you say, I'm the vine, you're the branches. Now, you guys are all, you know, you've been Christians for a while. You probably understand that metaphor. When, a, when a, a, someone that's newer into this stuff reads it, I'm the vine. They're thinking, well, this part's the vine. That's the part that crawls all over and, you know, the grapes grow on the vine. So Jesus says, he's this part and I'm the branch. You know what I mean? Well, what's the branch? I don't know. Vines don't have branches. That's a tree. What are we doing here, Jesus? Or maybe I'm this part. That's more like the branch. You know, and it, so it's not the best translation. I would for a translation like this. I'm the stalk. You are the danglies. I should write to NIV and see if I get danglies put in there. I don't think it's going to happen, but you know, but that's what he's, you know, that was the point. I'm the, I'm this part. You're these dangly part, okay? And uh, yeah, the cool thing about this this whole thing, in in this metaphor is, we're going to unpack those three principles, and they're golden principles. But spiritual health, it's it's not a it's not a magic checklist. You know, this isn't a magic checklist. These are the three golden keys. The, the cool thing about this metaphor is it puts spiritual health completely in the context of a relationship. The metaphor itself is relationship infused. You see that? that you, you, if you want to produce, it's, the production comes from staying well connected to me. Does that make sense? And, and of course, we're going to teach them these practices and these principles, but it's it's inherently relational. Growth and becoming stronger spiritually is intrinsically tied to the health of our relationship with Jesus. It's everything. Okay, so these aren't magic principles. As, as amazing as they are, they're not magic principles. They're the ways that we stay closely connected to Jesus. And Jesus produces the life. Jesus produces the, the juice, you know, the fruit, everything. Uh, so the pressure's off. We just got to stay closely connected. Okay, so what are these three connection keys? Well, that fourth page you've got, uh, you know, 
it's not pretty. I wish it was artistically as pretty as the whatever. And now I've kind of dissected them and I've used the word key, you know, I've used the whatever. But it's a relationship key, you know, and, and uh, so l let's just think about that first one. Now, in practical terms, because they're going to ask you, what does it mean to abide in Jesus? How do I abide in Jesus? And I think the principle there is simply us staying in, in touch with Jesus. Probably the best way I could say that in English. If you, if you, if, you know, uh, if you remain in me, if you abide in me, probably the best way to say that in English in the context of a relationship, with still keeping the metaphor of a con connection, like a vine, you know, would be we've got this great idiom, if you stay in touch. You know, it has built into the idea of touching, you know, as opposed to separating, but it's communicational. And I think that would be a great way to say it. This is the idea, look at it, it corresponds with this one. So this one is Jesus' words getting in us. This first one is the reciprocal. It's, it's us doing some commun communicational output towards him. You know, it's us staying in touch with him. It, it, it's great if your cousin is, uh, is always calling you and he's jibber-jabbering on the phone and his words are staying. He's like, oh, I got plenty of his words, you know. But then the other side of the relationship is, we got to stay in touch. We got to put ourselves out there a little bit too, to the other person. So these these one and two are reciprocal. First one is us staying in touch with him. The second one is his words staying in touch with us. So they're, they're literally kind of the flip sides of each other. So what would be the million dollar uh, Christian word we would use for this first one? Staying in touch with God, communicating what's on our heart to Him. What's the exactly? Yeah, this would be prayer. I, I don't. I, I like refreshing it and using like it would say stay in touch with Him because prayer sometimes is like oh you know what I mean. That's that, that might bring up a million things in their mind you don't know depending on their background. So you know if you're going to use the word prayer, you can. I think I do use it for this one just to simplify and especially be a memory device. You know for for what the first one is. But remember, it's more than that. This isn't, you know, intercessory prayer for the souls of people in Africa. You know, what's that? And that's the other side of it, too. That's the other side of it, too. You know, some people aren't heavy talkers. Okay. Even if they're in a relationship with you, they don't use a lot of words. And sometimes people bring that into their Christianity and they feel guilty for that. You know, I'm not as big a talker. He doesn't say you got to talk. Okay? Technically, he just says if you just... And that's why I like that. I like that before I just jump to prayer. I like that. What well, the heart of it is just staying in touch. Just stay in touch with me. You know, I may not even use words, but just, just stay in touch with me through your week. You know, let's have some time. Let's have some time. You know, we're, we're, we're connecting and you're opening your heart up to me in the way that's natural and fits the way I've made you. It can't just be a one way relationship that we got to do some work to stay in touch with him. Share the things that are going on in our heart. So that's number one. Any questions about number one? Us staying in touch with him some way, shape, or form. Good. Um, I think that it's good that you left that to the end. Mm. Because usually you do think like, oh, I got to like memorize. And like, like if you ask someone to pray, they get nervous and like mm. sweaty or like they're giving a speech or something. Okay, yeah. You know? and it, so I really like how you left that to the end. And you may not even use it. Just like, yeah. hey. Talk to Jesus. Yeah. Yeah. Stay, yeah. In, stay in touch as you're going through your week. Yeah. That, and for people that, especially are more introverted, that can be wonderfully freeing. Yeah. I don't have to be something I'm not in my interactions with this person. Yeah. And that's different than the way I interact with other people. I'm pretty sure he doesn't want you to be different with him than you are with other yeah. people. You know, he wants you to be real because he designed you that, yeah. that way, you know. So it's wonderful to learn that, that freedom. And there is a place for intercessory prayer. We're lifting up requests for other people yeah. and for other things. But, but John 15 is not it. John 15 well, principle is just, just us staying in touch. Friends, I mean, obviously God is, like, I don't want to just say he's your friend, but he is. Mm. Like, wouldn't you, like, talk with your friend? Yeah. And text, you know, a gazillion mm. times a day, or you FaceTime? Like, yeah. wouldn't you invest into your relationship with Jesus? Yeah. The same, like, magnitude or um, the same sense of freedom. Quantity yeah. Even, you mm -hmm. know, like, because there is a quantity, like, some. People are like, oh, you just need five minutes. And I'm like, you ain't going to make it if you 
I don't make it if I just do, a, you know, two minutes. Like, mm. I just, I mean, you won't get through life like that. Mm. Mm. That's a good point. The pastor once said, he, uh, little, you know? little prayer life, little power, much prayer life, much power. And, yeah, mm-hmm. it's like, mm. but I, mm. yeah, I just really like how you were focused more on the relational. Thing. Yeah. Because people do, they get, you know, you, you have someone who's just new in the faith, they'll, it's easy to draw back because they think it's like some big task yeah. list. And it's and they've like, heard other people pray. It's like so far from that, yeah. you know? By the time people get saved, they've normally heard some people pray. And who are the people they hear pray usually? Who are the just, most vocal people that pray? If you're new to church and you, you've you been hearing the pastors or the yeah, professionals on the stage praying. Oh, yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So now I get saved. Oh, key number one is I got to pray. <laughs> Well, I got, you know, and they, yeah. they can, they can innocently did just take on that moniker, whatever the way I heard him say that literally the phrases and the wording and the kind of rhythm and it just, it kind of, you know, and, and so to, to learn that there's that freedom, just, just stay in touch. Yeah. Just stay yeah. in touch with him. Just, just, you know, don't, don't get too weird with it. You know what I mean? Um, don't, don't, um, so, uh, yeah, good. Yeah. That's good for them to learn that. So healthy. I mean, mm-hmm. if they can learn that early on, if they just stay in touch with Jesus, if you just. Just stay in touch with them, some way, shape, or form, through your week, through your through this month, through this season. You're gonna grow a whole lot of fruit. I mean, it's incredible. It's incredible. It's so simple, you know. So many times, my sessions with people too are just just carving out the space for them to reflect. How's this been going this past season? How's key number one been going? Whew, I'll hear him sigh, you know, or something like that. And it's just you just take the time you need, you know, and it's just carving out that time. This might be the only hour in the entire month where they have time to just think about themselves and how their relationship with Jesus is going. Because the second they leave and go out, they got a list of things to do for other people. They're thinking about serving. They're building on other people. But how's it going you and Jesus? This is that one time. It's a precious thing to get together with someone and just say, how's things going with you and Jesus? And then just stop. Just give them time to... To think. Sometimes that's all they need. You know, they just need mm-hmm. ten minutes to think and recalibrate, and you know, and then they'll realize things. You know, it's like, oh yeah, this happened, or yeah, this happened. And I got out of my rhythm, and I got to get that back. Okay, yeah. You know, key key number one, super simple. Just stay in touch. Mm-hmm. Key number two, let's just rip through these. This is the flip side of his words getting in us. So this would be scripture intake. Jesus' words. Sticking in us. And again, you know, you may think, well, this is scripture memory. Eh, not exactly. You know, or this is, uh, you know, reading reading a chapter a day. Or this is, you know, in some pictures that you have in your mind. If it's at the core, at the center, it's just his words sticking in us. Okay. The, the imagery here that, that I give people is a marinade. Imagine you're the, you're the slow cooker filled with the marinade sauce. You're just, a, you're just a pot full of sauce. That's all we are, okay? And then Jesus' words is like the meat, okay? He says, if my words stick in you, they get in you. What happens? That meat gets out in that marinade. All that flavor comes out, you know. Uh, I guess it's backwards because the, the flavor from that's supposed to go in. Okay, what do we, we need? I need a soup. I'm going to change it to a soup. Is that better? All the women are like, yeah, soup. Yeah. You know, and, and then that flavor from that meat goes into that soup or from the whatever. I don't cook soup, man. I don't know what I'm talking about. But you get what I'm trying to say there. You can't put the salt in there. Yeah, what? Fix my metaphor. What does my metaphor need to be here? Fix me. Because you don't stick meat in and take it out. Is there something you stick in and then if you don't keep it in long enough, you don't get all the flavor? What would that be? That's the kind of metaphor I want. Well, maybe the sauce would be Jesus. The sauce would be Jesus? I don't know. Yeah. I'm thinking and then that gets into the meat. Because if you take the meat out right away, then it's not going to have the flavor of the sauce. Ah, so we're the meat? Just switch it around. I think. Yeah, we're the meat. He's, I think. The, or like the, he's sauce the sauce. He's the sauce? something. Yeah. Okay. So the sauce got to get into the meat. Yeah. And the idea is it's got to stick there for a while. So this thing of like speed reading, you know, a chapter a day, what's that? That's taking that meat, dropping the sauce, pull it right out. You know what I mean? That's it. Like flipping through a magazine article. 
Yeah, you know, the, the magic is in this word stick. Stick. It's just sometimes maybe less is more. Maybe instead of reading, if you have a certain amount of time allotted, instead of reading as much as you could in that time, maybe you cut that in half. Read a little slower. It's just one verse or one phrase in Proverbs. If it can stick. You tend to read mm-hmm. you know, um, a chapter, and there's times that. You know, Especially with the Proverbs. And so much. Hmm. It expounds hmm. on one word or one little bit of something, and you can, you can just sit there and, and marinate for hours. Hmm. I like the I'm word. Meditating. I like that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, good. That's the principle. You know, and some people are auditory, you know, so this isn't reading. Even if you can say, oh, this is reading the Bible. It doesn't say reading. Most people in the world are illiterate. You know, well, not, not nowadays, but there's still a lot. And a lot of tribes I've been to where a lot of them are, you know, it doesn't say you have to read it. It might be auditory. It might be listening to it. I have one person, they uh, vacuum churches, vacuum a church, just one church. Each of the different rooms, he says he goes in, there'd be a verse on the wall. And so he did to get scripture in him. So when he's in that room, vacuuming, he looks at the verse. And then that's the verse he kind of just soaks on while he's vacuuming that room. He's not opening his Bible at all this whole week. You know, so like, well, that's a second class Christian. But let me tell you, God's word is soaking in him probably more than a lot of other people that are cracking it open. You know. So the principle is his word sticking in us. And then... Uh, Finally, number three, you know, when you come across a command that you have a heart that is, okay, if if I'm not putting this into practice in my life, I'm going to do it. That's the principle there of number three. Let me uh, switch this over. One thing I want to say about number three is uh, all of Jesus' words are valuable here for number two. Now he just puts a spotlight on the commands. Out of all that Jesus taught, all the red letters... The commands represent 5%. Okay, 5% of the red letters are commands. 95% is just sharing his heart, sharing things on on his heart, sharing things, teachings, you know. 5% are commands. So most of the time when when we're reading Jesus' words, we're not going to come across a command, all right? But on those days when we do, you know, you get to Matthew 6. When you pray, Jesus says, go in your room. Try to keep it as secret as possible. Don't, don't flaunt it, all right? Keep your prayer life as discreet as possible, right? Command. Okay, so they're reading that day. When they come across that command, have a heart that says, okay, is this in my life? No, if not, I'm going to try to put it in my life starting today. Have a stance of obedience, a posture of responsiveness. That's number three. Interestingly, of those commands, four out of five are active. Things he actively wants us to try to work into our life. Only one out of five is don't do this. So, very interesting. Well, those are the three. I mean, we could, we could, I've got one, one, I'm going to give you a break and we've got one final section, but... I, I could give the benediction right now and send you home because that, this, there's, there's nothing better after, after this. I mean, you know, um, if, if you're the kind of person you check out once you've gotten the gold, well, this is the time to check out because I mean, everything that now is just, you know, it's, it's, it's not, it's not going to be as good. You know, this is, this is it right here. These, these three are, are the heart and soul of, of nurturing. It's helping them stay close to Jesus. And these are the three practices he prescribes so i'll give you that break let's see what time we got you know what why don't you just take till uh take take a 10 minute break here use the rat restroom if you got we'll, we'll do the final session at eight and uh uh and then we'll we'll get out of here you guys are doing great Instigator. It's a good, good kind of instigator. So, okay, we're going to go on the final section here of tonight of the session three. 
and, and really, this is this is honestly the, it's the same. It's the same as we just covered, just put in a different skin. So uh, let's see. That's going. So if you've got your uh, b before you do this, I'm going to tell you where to turn. But this is it. These three, uh, and let me just re review the three. You staying in touch with me, just that person that you're shepherding in Jesus. If they just if if they will just stay in touch with Jesus. Number two, is still let Jesus stay in touch with them. Okay, and get in that get in that that word, and let it get inside. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's. Yep. That's that is the dead center bullseye of their health. Well, is is their connection with Jesus? And then finally, if they can learn this principle, when they come to a command, let me try to do it. Let me put it into practice. Be responsive. Be a doer, like James says, not just a, a reader. Those three. If they get those three, they are good to go. <laughs> I mean, they will. They got everything they need. Because they have Jesus and he'll produce all the rest. So there's an incredible amount of richness here. And really, we're going to turn the page and go on to something different, but it's not going to be something different. The next sheet that we're going to go to is, I use it as the spiritual growth process for the young adults. And what I want you to see is, it literally is just these three. What I've done is I've just taken the vine imagery and turned it into a USB cable, like a USB charging electronic imagery. But it's the same thing. And if you like this little diagnostic I got, you can use it. If it overclutters it and you got a wobbly table in your house, you just fold that thing up and shove it in there. The vine is the heart and soul. Okay? This is nothing new on top of it. It's literally just the vine transformed into a little different image. And you know, um, so you can go to tab nine, and that's the cross point spiritual growth process. And you'll see right in it, you'll see the vine right there. Okay. Go to the blank one. Okay. What you'll notice there is that what I did is I I took the top two and I'm calling these two abide. Why 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 am I using that word for these two? Huh? Yeah, it, they both have the word abide in them, you know, and, and this is the relationship side of it. This is the communication, the, you know, and now they may not know the word abide, you can just throw it out, but that's, that's where I was putting these two as abide, and then I'm calling this one obey. And where did I get obey? <laughs> because that's what it is. You know what I mean? So it's not, I'm not going to trademark this abide obey I thing, you know what I'm saying? Really it's deep, not, Sal, you know, it's not, it's like, not very. Yeah. You know. Yeah. Basically it's a, Yeah. So yeah, that that's I mean that's it. Abide obey. Um so and then I've taken the first two instead of on top of each other, I've just put them sideways. You see them that's they're the same ones. Key number 1, I'm calling it this. Key number 2. And then all I'm doing now in terms of this diagnostic if you, if you go down to the, the bottom part, it's the obey. And you'll notice that it branches off and I've got all this complicated stuff. Well, maybe someday I'll clean it up and make it less complicated. But the reason is this. Number three is very simple and I always want it to remain simple. When you come across the command of Jesus, do it. I could just cut them free with those three, not specify anymore. But... You know, um, the, the analogy I use is kind of like if you're, if you're building a house or let's, let's say some massive project, but um, I'm going to do house. I suppose I've got to turn that because it records what that sees. Okay. If you're, you've got some massive project, you know, and that, uh, let's just say it's, it's, a, it's a house. Okay. Each command might be, okay, uh, make sure you got locks on all your doors. Okay, yeah, we got locks on all the doors. Locks on all the doors. Okay, what would be another? You know, how to build a house well. Uh, 
I'm not a builder, so I don't know, but, you know. Um, Make sure it's insulated. Insulated. Yeah. yeah, there we go. And that might be the love command. Love one another. Keep it insulated and warm, you know. That's great. Yeah, insulated. Okay, so that's John 15, 12. Love one another. You What's want it? some electricity? You want some electricity. Exactly. Now, <laughs> now, if you're assembling the house, oh, plumbing. You want to have plumbing, right? You want to make sure you're plumbing. Yeah, that might be the, that might be the, yeah, detox. I like it. Okay, let's put a little. Okay, that's the little toilet. So, now, somebody did mention lighting. Now, if you're going to build an, or a, a, build this house... You could save lighting, like, like there's 200, there are 200 commands of Jesus, if you go through all, the Old New Testament. Each one of them is valuable. And, and some, just for this relationship, remember this principle. There's principles, you know, when you're, don't rebuke an older person sharply. Okay, just one little simple. Okay. Uh, if somebody's mean to you, do this. When someone's crying, weep with them. You know, all these little commands, they're all valuable. Put in a toilet, get the lock on the door. Bit by bit, they're going to build their house. But some, some parts of building houses, it's nice to have early on in the construction process, for instance, Lighting. <laughs> lighting, yeah, so that the rest of the project, when you're installing that plumbing, it's nice to have some lights out of the house at that point. You don't screw the, you know, the, the plumbing into the sink or something, you know, the, from the toilet into the sink. Or that could be bad, you know. So, so, yeah, some things it's good to have ordered a little early on in your Christian journey because it'll help you for the whole Christian journey. So, yeah, and, and so all, all I've done with the commands is I've picked just the pastor and me let me pick. Let me give them four to start with, that are foundational, and that will nurture, nourish them, to be able to carry out all the rest. One of the ones, it's the first one, is have a church family you're connected with. <laughs> you know, I mean, a lot of Christians think that's optional nowadays because it because it is a personal relationship. We've covered that. It is, but Hebrews ten twenty five, don't give up meeting together. Okay, First Corinthians, it's a body. And you literally need the other parts. And the, the imagery is a local church being a body, you know, and each, each Christian is like an organ in the body. So it's very, you know, the key word is need, need, need. This is an optional that will benefit you. This is like life and death kind of need. That's the word, you know. So, yeah, you know, now maybe I don't tell them it's important to have a local church. I wait. I let them get in the word. And eventually they're going to find that one. But, I, I, you know, Maybe that's year seven when they come to Hebrews. I don't know when they read Hebrews. You know what I mean? It's, it might be kind of in the back of the New Testament. You know, I'd love for them to learn that one early on in the journey. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? So it's not that that any one command is more important than the other. I've picked four. You might pick a different four. Yeah. You know, I, I use this with all the, the young adults, so it's good for consistency. That's that's our process here. Um, but I want you to understand. I don't think these are more inspired than any of the other ones at all. I just I thought they're good in terms of order to have these these four as, as order. And you might see that you just got a little shepherd in you and you've all got some some life wisdom and you probably see why I've pick picked those four um, as, as good foundational ones. Um, so is that clear? I'm not I'm not trying to add anything here. It's just that literally that diagram that we've got, it's gonna be the abide at the top and obey in the bottom. So let's just run through those four obey because you are, we already know the first two, the abide. And just to explain those, big group fellowship, you need a church family. Uh, I don't know why Jesus said it. It must be important. I could specify, you know, a bunch of reasons why, because I think there's a lot. In fact, I did a, a, a series um, called uh, When 13 Reasons Why was, was big among the young adults. I did, I did one, a little series called uh, 13 Reasons Why uh, Spiritual Suicide Edition. And it was 13 Reasons Why Severing Yourself from a Local Church is spiritual suicide. And I came up with 13 reasons why. And so I do think there's, there's reasons why you need a fellowship with local church as a whole. Um, big group fellowships, as I call it, are not great at everything. You come to church, you know, um, and it's a hard month with some of the stuff the young adults struggle with, you know, body image. Okay. You're not necessarily going to stand up in the worship time and unburden your heart. You know, to the whole congregation. Big groups aren't great for that. They're not great for that. You're going to get good worship. You're going to get good Bible teaching from someone that's trained to give you a really high quality meal once a week. So if you were just snacking during the week, okay, Dave's going to give a real good 2,000 calorie meal right there. Boom, get you, get you, you know. Um, gets interaction with the whole range of, of 
the body of Christ with all the different gifts. You know, so there might be an encourager you need that day. There might be somebody else, you know, and just a random comment somebody might make to build you up. Just stay in touch with all the body parts in some way, shape, or form. It gives your leadership face time with you. If they're supposed to be watching out for you like these elders. If they don't even know who you are because you're not even around. Like That decreases their quality of care. You know, so get, There's a lot of reasons why. And, uh, but the heart and soul of it is, is um, we need it. It's clear. Um, don't give up on it. In fact, he says, as, as the day gets closer to Jesus' return, be meeting together more rather than, rather than less. And the context there, Hebrews 10, is big group fellowship in the local church with all the body parts. Okay. Now, I want to just go to the number three, the, the reciprocal nurturing fellowship. I like to do that right after that because what big group fellowship is weak on, nurturing fellowship is good on. Okay. Nurturing fellowship, and I got three examples there. It could be a committed friend. It could be uh, a nurturing small group. It could be someone discipling you. Remember that you get that for a year or two as a, as a younger believer. You get someone discipling for that year. Okay, for that year, you're probably covered with nurturing fellowship because you're spending a lot of time with that person. Okay, of course, it's temporary. The rest of your Christian journey, you'll need something else for nurturing fellowship. A fourth option to put on that list would be a Christian spouse. This is someone that you can easily go deeper with. Did you get that? So that person, you know, when the body image stuff is flaring up, it's a hard week. This is that person you can send them a text. Hey, pray for me this week. You know, and because you've probably already talked to them, they'll probably know what you're meaning. You might not even need to say more than that. Mm-hmm. It's nurturing. Every person in the body of Christ just needs some outlet they can go deeper with, with, with the personal stuff. And if you ask me for a verse for this one, well, I'd say just trust me as a pastor, you need it. But um, number two, I would say, just about all of the one another's of Scripture, and there's a lot, are done better in the context of safer, more intimate relationships. I'll give you a for instance. Confess your sins to one another. Command. James 5.16. And pray for one another. I'm really struggling with this this week. Big group fellowship, not the best setting for obeying that command. Be hard. Nurturing fellowship, still might be scary. <laughs> but... Um, a, a lot more doable. Um, Philippians 2.4 uh, Each one not looking, paying careful attention in Greek, skopali, the things related to themselves, but each person paying careful attention to the things related to others. And then it uses the word akastos in Greek, individually. Not each person carefully analyzing all their, you know, just fixated on themselves and their own interests, but each person Carefully thinking about another person individually in their local church. I mean, can you do that in a big group setting? No. I mean, I don't know. You can, like, watch what they're wearing. It's like, oh, she's got, you know. But, I mean, you're not supposed to talk, for instance. You know, even find out what's going on. You can do it in the cafe after the service, you know, kind of a thing. Maybe before the service. You know, but these kind of things are best done in in more nurturing fellowship settings. A, A Sunday school class, maybe before you know, or um, at lunch with a friend, you know, or at home with a Christian spouse, you know, the kind of, uh, um, those kind of activities where it's just better in a, in a smaller relational setting. So, yes, uh, that's big group fellowship and that's nurturing fellowship. Do you see how they complement each other? They're not a war. Um, the third one there in the middle is I've got primary care it still says pastor, and again, we already covered stereotypes of pastor. When I say primary care pastor, I mean a shepherd. Somebody that's got some shepherd in them that's looking out for you. So primary care person, PCP. You know, um, so yes, I think a P- every sheep needs a shepherd. That's, that was a, if I'm going to trademark anything from this course, I like that phrase. Maybe I'll trademark that. So I don't, I don't, I'm not going to do that. It costs money to trademark. So. <laughs> but I like that phrase, every, for every sheep. A shepherd. Remember what Jesus called in, in week two, if you were here? What did the two words segment? Arrest what? Did, and help. Yeah, a sheep without a shepherd is her, will will their yeah. their Christian journey, their private walk with Jesus yeah. through life, as good as Jesus is, will still be characterized by unnecessary harassment mm-hmm. and unnecessary helplessness. Yeah. Um, so they need every sheep needs a shepherd. And I would encourage you guys that are in this room, if you don't have somebody in that role doing that for you, I would challenge you 
before you try to start doing that for somebody else. Find someone who say, you know what, I'll look after you. You know, if they ask, if you, if they ask you, well, what do you want me to do for you? Once a quarter, maybe check in, see how I'm doing. Um, give somebody the freedom to be that person for, for you. You know, somebody more mature, somebody older. Um, if you're 80 years old, find someone that's 90. They're here. These, 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 these men and women are out there, and they'd probably be honored that you asked them. Find some godly person that you respect that. Um, or, you know, if, if that's Pastor Dave or one of the bona fide official pastors, uh, they'll work too. You know, we've been set up for those guys. So, uh, but, yeah, for every sheep, a shepherd. When I came here, I got to put my money where my mouth is because I didn't have a pastor looking out for me, and now I'm pastoring, and I'm like, ah, I know my theology. I need somebody. And I was like, ah. You know, what am I going to do? You know, maybe I get an exception because I'm a pastor, right? Like, yeah, i got a special spiritual gift. You don't need shepherd. No, no. So I, I wrote to a couple of my former pastors. And um, no, I didn't. I hemmed and hawed for a couple years and finally finally got it out, you know, uh, on paper. And said, I'm just got to do this right now. And just sat down and took 20 minutes. It's, it's amazing how it can be so hard to find time to do things that are so important, they don't even take that long to do. But somehow, you ever notice that? It's like, this is an important thing. Why have I not been able to carve out 20 minutes to do this? I just couldn't sit, find, I genuinely couldn't find time to sit down and, you know, type a letter. I think of it random times and I feel guilty. I'm like, oh, I can't do it now. I'm on, the, you know, I'm like, this car ride, you know, I can't stop. And so I got to remember to do that, you know, be one of those, I got to, got to do that, you know, six months goes by, a year, you know what I mean? So, Finally did it, and one of the two wrote back and said, when I was in this stage of life, I remember really wanting um, somebody uh, to shepherd me and not being able to find an older man that was um, you know, available and felt comfortable doing that. You know? And he said, and I resolved that if any young, younger pastor ever reached out to me, I would say yes automatically. And so he said, so I'm saying yes automatically. And... Um, yeah, you know, he just sends me a text every, every, I don't keep track really, it's not, but I would guess it's every two to three months he sends me, he says, hey, I'd love to catch up, got any time this week, you know, and then I, I take a look at my calendar and say, yeah, I got Wednesday open, and we, we, we just chat on a Wednesday afternoon, he just listens, loves, asks me how my, my walk with Jesus is going, <laughs> that's literally all he does, well, you know, and then uh, say hi to Amanda for me, all right, thanks, Pastor, bye-bye. And uh, and then at times when when the life falls apart and the floor breaks down underneath your feet, you know what I'm talking about. Those seasons where everything's going smooth, and all of a sudden things are not going smooth instantly. Who do I text? <laughs> hey, uh, you, I, I'd love to run this by you. You think you got any time? We could talk, chat, you know. And uh, yeah, we do that. He just he just just my shepherd. So. For every sheep is shepherd. Yeah, big group fellowship, nurturing fellow shepherd, and some form of service. That's the fourth one. The fifth one is disciple others, and, you know, um, that's definitely... Some, the reason I put that one on there is because when I came to this church, like all the other Christian practices, we were super strong at, but nobody was discipling anybody. Like that, that one, nobody... You could ask who's discipling someone younger. Nobody was doing it. Nobody even knew, you know, it was kind of fuzzy what it was. So I put that on because um, it's something that I, I feel like in the American church, there... The, Ah, it's, maybe it's globally. I'm not blaming the American church. I'm just not, I don't know about other places, but I don't see a lot of discipling um, going on. I remember writing to older men in my home church and guys were like, you want me to do what for you? And he was like, so, you know, disciple me. I was like, you know, and um, so, you know, I'm trying to encourage, bring a revival of that. It is very relationally intense and it's asking a lot for a year or two to literally take some younger believer under your wing, teach him, you know, the New Testament commands. Yeah, that's where they actually will learn all these things. You know, in one fell swoop in a couple of years with somebody actually there that they can ask questions about. But um, so I put that on there. A lot of my young adults aren't ready f for that, you know, initially, but um, it's something to aspire to. Um, so service, this is immediate, really relevant. I try to get the first, those four plugs in immediately with them. Try to, you know, even visit, visit number two. You know, it's like, all right, how's your walk with Jesus going? One, two, you got a church family? You got a pastor looking out for you? Um, you got some form of nurturing fellowship? No, okay, well, let's start praying. God provide one sister in Christ you can be real with, go deeper with, provide, pray. And then let's find some place for you to, find some way for you to serve here. 
Um, and there's, there's verses for that. Uh, 1 Peter 4, 8 and 9. Each one should use whatever gift they've got to serve. You know, I um, had one young adult say, is that, is that required? Do I actually have to pick some way to serve? I was like, I mean, remember the New Testament? Yes, you do. Yes, yes, really, that was not an optional form. Yeah, so, uh, uh, Galatians 5.13, serve one another in love. You know, the, the mindset that church is someplace you come to just absorb, and if you like it, you stay, and if you don't, you find some other place you like. We got to get rid of that consumer motto. Like, this is a place you go where you can, you need, and then you serve because you need to serve to stay strong spiritually, and it will bless, bless them. So, yeah, right out the gun, right... Baby Christian, they can serve. There's no time requirement. You can find some way to serve. And as you get to know them, you know, you'll find things, you know, are you a people person or more of a quieter person? You like behind the scenes stuff? Find something that's a good fit for them. And uh, yeah. So that's this. I mean, any, any question? That, that this is, it's just abide and obey. And then I've just dressed up obey to give them a f- four really practical things that, that they can instantly. Four little strands of obedience that if they get in right away, oh my goodness, that will help them their whole journey long, you know. So that, but, but really it's not, uh, it's John 5th, this is it. This is the heart and soul. And, uh, and this just puts it in a little checklist. And they like this, they, they like this, they can see this, and they kind of rate themselves. Like this quarter, this past quarter, how's, how's key one going this past quarter? Ooh. Been tanking on that one. Okay, put down, what do you think? One to ten, write it down a number, and they'll put their number in there. I bet about a one. All right, and we just go through them, and then, okay, which one do you want to work on? Well, let's work on the ones that we had. If you had any, the lowest numbers we work on, you know, kind of a thing. And then, um, so, yeah, uh, this, that's, that's tab number nine. That's what that is. I've got some samples. Uh, yeah, wow, we've got, we've got, a little bit of time here. Uh, we'll look at, let's look at the first handout, which is uh, Jessica. This is an actual one, so that's kind of cool. It's like, it's literally one of the young adults here. I just changed the name so you don't know who it is, but it's one of the young adults here's little sheet, and that's 3A. Jessica. Did you give multiple copies of this? So that we it's just a resource, or? yeah. I've given you okay. Vine ones and those diagnostic okay. ones. Like I said, you... I didn't know if you wanted those or... Nope, for us. nope, they're for you. That, okay. Those binders are yours yours to keep, okay. you know, and, and that's... It's, it's, it's just uh, it's a tool. All the young adults know about... Well, not all of them. A lot of them know about that spiritual growth process, that, that the plugs one. So... That's nice for the sake of building course effects. Like, you know, everybody knows they're supposed to have a form of service. So what's your service? What's your, you know, and, and um, it's a great to have that, that uh, momentum. So I like the, that that's the continuity of introducing you guys to that. It'd be good for the non-young adults, too, in the church. So, yeah, go ahead. I was just thinking of Matt because I saw him outside tying his shoe and then he's just not he here. I did say, Is he okay? I don't know. Let me I see. saw I him in too. the work truck, but then I, know. I didn't see him. Didn't you say he was on the phone, Scott? He was on the phone when I came in. Yeah, yeah I'm assuming oh. something came up that pulled him. I was just thinking, my water bottle in the work truck pulled out. I had thought maybe, oh. maybe it was Tom dropping you off. So I had, no, it was Matt. Tom, Tom, well, Tom, no, you know what? Tom was here meeting with Fred. And so you probably did see Tom. Mm-hmm. I'm just like a truck and yeah. was driving. Yeah. He, I was on my way, way here, after he me stopped by a train and he was leaving here, so it probably was. Well, Matt, we're missing you. <laughs> Wish you were here. <laughs> You're so chill and encouraging. Yeah. So, won't be the same, you watching on the video. Uh, let's see. Okay. He said everything's okay. Good. Yeah. Okay, good. I'm sure something came up. Okay, uh, so let's just look at Jessica. Yeah, now this, Jessica is great. I'm telling you, when she comes in, I pull this sheet out, and she sighs. She's like, Whew. okay. And I can, go for, I can go to the drinking fountain. In fact, I do. I'm, like, I'm going to go fill up my thing. I had come back, and she has a list written for herself of what screws she wants to tighten up for this quarter, what her plan is, what, what, what. Like, that's all she needs is just 
10 minutes of space to actually stop and take a pulse for herself how things are going with her and Jesus. You know, and so, yeah, uh, this one, you know, has been praying a lot. Pierre, I mean, these are just my notes that I left to myself, you know, after, for after, after our visitor, during our visit, I jot this down so I can remember. Uh, now, if, if you guys are, are shepherding one person, you probably don't need to take notes. You probably remember, but I have, a, you know, 15, and then I don't remember who's working on what. So this, this helps me. But it also makes a good handout because you can see this in real life. Has been, she's been praying a lot. Uh, PRN, meaning just as things come to mind as it's needed through the day. Yeah, she's been interacting with Jesus, so that, that was great. So, okay, great. Uh, key number two, how's that one going, Jessica? How's number two going? How's, how's Jesus' words been getting in you this quarter? Okay, she's going to try to do a Bible verse of the day using an app on her phone, but she needs an app that gives a, a daily, like, bleep, bleep, you know, because otherwise oh, she doesn't remember. That's a weakness. And so, you know, then I was like, we were both trying out all these apps, trying to find one, you know, that's like a decent version, you know, too. And it has a little thing on it. So I had, I think I had three or four apps on my phone at one time because I'm trying to find one for Jessica, you know, kind of thing. Um, so, okay, that's that, you know, um, you find a form that works for them and that's a good fit for them and you go with it. It's, it's, it doesn't matter what way, shape or form. It's Jesus' words sticking in them and... Um, um, yeah, so that was for her. Let's see, obey. And then we go through, you know, how about number three? And this one, you see, I got 3A, 3B. That, I just put that three there. So these aren't new things. This is all from the third one. This is all the obey. You know, that's why I put that little lettering there. I don't think they're on your blank ones. But I'm just trying to show them. I'm not inventing other things here. These are all just a part of obeying. Uh, big group fellowship. She's going to come to, with blank once she gets a vaccine. She found that online is not as edifying for her. Yeah, she'd been doing the online thing. She's like, I need to get back. It's not as good. So um, that was her goal for this quarter. Once she's waiting on this other person to get a thing, she's staying online until then. Primary care pastors got me. We just checked that off because obviously we're meeting together in session, so that's working, you know. Uh, nurturing fellowship, COVID wrecked her little group study. Yeah, she had a plan, and, and COVID kind of kicked that in the teeth. So post-COVID, they, they're going to get it back. So my next visit with her will be her first post-COVID visit, and I'll ask how that's been going. And um, it's probably I already know her. It's probably going to say hasn't hasn't happened. I'm texting them right now. Like she literally uses my time in, and that's precious. This is like she's very busy, you know. Um, and I don't want to give too many details because you, you, I don't think anybody in this room knows her, anyways. But you know, she even she cares a lot for a lot of other people and has a lot of responsibilities on her. And this is the one hour or hour and a half that is just about her. Just about her. And she's old enough where she just needs the time. She just needs the office space, you know, um, to, to just get there without a lot of demands on her, you know, and kids, just to think about her spiritual health. And so I can, I can already tell you that's it probably hasn't happened, but the next time it will, because now COVID will be, you know, and she'll, she'll text, probably text the, the, the other ladies right there in my office and, then once that ball gets rolling, it'll probably be good. Service. The space and accountability. You know, yeah. If we don't have that to push us or make us feel, whether it's guilt or that somebody cares or what. Sure. You know, you might be able to carve out a corner, you know, sitting on the couch by yourself. Mm-hmm. But you don't have somebody to answer to to mm-hmm. keep you on track. Sure, that's a good you point. Protect that yeah. time and that space for you. Sure, yep. Melt away. Yep, that's a great point. That's a great point. So yeah, I've got a couple other ones there, Jason and Alex. You know, and they're they different. It's different for different ones uh, of them. Maybe we'll just look at Alex's one, and you guys can take, uh, or we'll look at Jason's. You guys can take Alex home with you. Uh, let's see. Yeah, this is a brand new one. This is uh, Alex or Jason. Jason just started. Like my first session with it was with him was you know a month ago and so i introduced him to the vine like we just talked about the vine these three principles and then we you know this is the first time ever him crafting a plan for his spirit for his relationship with jesus never had a plan in place so he wasn't reading the word he's been in this church since he was a little baby 17 now but you know it's one thing for dave to preach we should be reading the word but 
it's great to have somebody help you figure out a plan to do that. You know what I mean? And give you some time to think about it. And um, so, yeah, we made a plan, and his little plan helped him craft it. I let him pick it. I was like, what do you, how much do you want to take? You just got to get scripture in you. Or, no, the first one is you staying in touch with Jesus. So his goal was a 14-minute chat. And then, uh, so, uh, yeah, I like that plan, and we made that his goal. For his goal for getting Jesus' words sticking in him, uh, yeah, he rated that one 3 out of 10. Um, no, we didn't have time to work on that one. So next time that our next visit, we're going to work on that one. Um, we, we worked on key number one. And then big group fellowship, yeah, we worked on those two. Key number one and, and key number three A, I guess. The big group fellowship, he, he wasn't getting to church. Um, he had been coming when he was in kids' ministry, and he had stayed as a helper in kids' ministry. So it was like good through zero to 13, and then like 14, 15, 16 while helping out. But now he's 17. There's no kids' ministry. hasn't been, you know, I mean, not for what he was doing. And he just hasn't, he just kind of had fall, you know, was doing young adults. He would come some of, the, some of the weeks for young adults Thursday, but definitely wasn't here on Sunday. And it's like, all right. Hey, let's go. You're an adult, man. This is this is what we do. Come to big church, you know. So, uh, so he, you know, he so he came up with a plan. I was like, come up with a plan. I give you three minutes. Go, you know. And so he was like thinking about it, and, you know. Came up with a plan, and you know, he's 17, so that's why I would say it like that. Obviously, if it was an adult, I wouldn't say come up with a plan. Go, you know. But it, he he's great. He came up with an excellent plan. He hasn't missed a Sunday, you know. I don't think since he found somebody to give him a ride. I think, but uh, yeah. Um, Pastor, he has me starting, just starting with him. Um, he'd been in young adults, but I wouldn't say I'd been his pastor because I was doing no individual shepherding with him. So I guess halfway I was his pastor, I was doing like group shepherding, but not individual. Does that make sense? So I like to think of this one, it's, it's the more on the individual side. Dave can teach everybody as a group teaching, you know what I mean, the Sunday sermon. Or me, I can teach all the young adults on Thursday. Or, but yeah. Nurturing Fellowship, we've got that for every young adult. We have something set up on Thursdays. Most of them, right, Ashley? I mean, we've got some that, that, that got some odd, odd men and women out, but a lot of them Thursday, they get that, and this one's got a good one on Thursday. Miscellaneous Service, yeah, he picked one there. He's not ready to disciple somebody else, but... Yeah, next time I get together with them, it'll be work on number two. Because that first, you know, that first visit, hey, if they got none of them in place... You know what I mean? You, I mean, depend. You don't want that to be like a four-hour session. You know what I mean, kind of thing. And you don't want to make it a, uh, unless they really want that, and you sense that they're like, no, I want to get all this in right now. Um, that's uh, yeah. That's how I do do it. So yeah, I don't. I, I think uh, just gonna review what we've covered and and um, and uh, open up any questions that you have. And I'm gonna stop adding new content. We've we've. The heart and soul today is this right here. We did it. We talked about a little detox, you know, I, and I do think that's valuable early on in the start of your Christian journey. If you can just learn the principles that if you've got open doors, darkness is going to get in. It's going to gunk up this. So get all the gunk out at the front end if you can. A little detox binder you can give to them or um, to, to, to walk through. Uh, but yeah, this is then, then into strength, shepherding them into strength. This is it right here. Abiding and obeying. And then that little diagnostic that we added in the, in the third segment is just simply this. And then I just elaborate this to give them four initial ones to get them going. Uh, and I give them a good, good foundation in place. So, so yeah, any, any questions for me in terms of... This is it. I mean, this is shepherding people. It's just getting together with them. How's your walk with Jesus going? Where can we make it stronger? You know? And, uh... Do you have, like, recommendations, though, for, like... Because I was just thinking of, like, male and female. Like, mm-hmm. that can get kind of... Yep. Like, I don't know. I just feel like there should be some rail guards or something. Yep. Definitely. Um, how do you go about that? Like, yep. I would... I don't know. I personally... I don't, young men or even men my age, I just don't. Yeah. Like they're off. I'm just, I mm-hmm. only yeah. work with women. And sure. So how do you do that as, you know what I mean? Like, well, you wouldn't. I mean, you know, if you don't feel comfortable with it, but I have just five wouldn't. boys. And 
Okay. Okay. So I have five sons. Oh, yeah, so you so, are shepherding young... Well, but, oh. I'm, but I'm saying, like, mm. you know, they're friends that come along, so I just keep the boys together, but I, it's, I don't know, I think it can get complicated. Yeah. I just, I don't know what your recommendation would be for... Yeah, I wouldn't be an expert on that, but I would say um, my recommendation would be if you're not comfortable, don't do it, like, definitely. Yeah. And then even if you are comfortable, definitely be wise with it, like... Um, well, never alone. Like, never like, alone. I mean, if I don't even take the friends home alone. Like, I'm yeah. just like, I need someone with me. Because yep. Yeah, that's good. It's crazy N- things that's if, going on nowadays. Yep. Like, yeah, but even no if... No what age you are. a couple, or doesn't that work with your schedule? Yeah. Like, and that's something to think about, too. Yeah, like, so, for instance, for me, um, there's several young ladies and started with me as minors. So, first of all, their parents... Uh, need to be supportive uh, that goes no matter what the gender is yeah. yeah if they're a minor here their parents are the linchpins yeah. of being teamwork of, of this so the parents have to support it number two you still have to be comfortable with it if you're not comfortable with it you yeah. don't do it so um number three they have to be comfortable with it too mm-hmm. if they're not don't do it yeah i would say and then number four even if all those other things line up which they did with all the ones in my case I'm never alone with them. Mm. I, even the ones that are older and the ones that are younger, it doesn't matter, minor or not. Um, uh, the, I'm never, so I will do the sessions at my house. So my wife and I will take the person out to lunch. Okay. Even our little baby will be there. We'll eat lunch, just talk, get caught up how, how, their, how stuff's been in the last quarter. And then we'll have a, a pastoral visit. My wife will leave and we'll do, uh, my wife won't leave, leave, but she'll leave the table and she'll just be around the house. Okay. No doors closed, you know what I mean? Okay. She, she'll, I have her come down at least once during the time that I'm with. I just say, just come down. Okay. Just find a reason to come down and walk so that you're walking through at least once, okay. you know. And, and, um, and uh, yeah, that's so, I, and I will never cry uncle on that. I will never be with a female. Even if, if it meets at church, it's the same thing. Cheryl has to be here in the office. Um, I have a window on my um, door. It's just, there's just some things I, I, I will never cry uncle on, you know, if, it, if it's, well, Cheryl's got to go. I got to run. I'm leaving. Guess what? Our session's over. <laughs> Sorry. I mean, it's done. You know, well, well you know, if you're going to do, if you're going to, if you're going to, especially if you're going to cross, if you're going to cross um, gender. Yeah. I mean, but even if you're going to cross, yeah, even if, yep. even if you're not, even if you're going to cross a uh, cross age, I would say, you know, if Dave and Scott want to get, get together for coffee, okay, that I'd be okay with. But if Dave and a, a 14 year old, you know, yeah. that, that everything I said with the females, I would do and do yeah. with the thing. And I won't drive them, al- al- you know what I mean? Alone. Yeah. Um, or pick the, so yeah. Um, but you know, even with that, there's some great value in, in girls having, yeah. And I say this as someone who's, I think half of the ones under my primary care are female. There's some great value in them having a female. In other words, yeah. I realize my weaknesses, you know, and I, I hope that the other women in their life, I, I talk openly with, with them that, you know, there's some, some areas I can't, I'm not going to go with, yeah. but I hope you will go there with the other women in your life because it's yeah. important, you know, and, and lean on that because there, there's, as women, you guys can go places and same probably with the guys. I can go places very easily yeah. with the guys that maybe you'd be uncomfortable going. So, yeah. so yeah, um, I don't know if that helps. It gives, gives no, some, it some principles I, and some... Because you were saying girls' names, so I was thinking, how does he do that? Yep, because, yep. Yeah. Yes, that is exactly it. With fear and trepidation, yes. Um, partners yeah <laughs> because and that's and typically yeah. like if i've had a young lady that i've talked to or anything it's always been a thing of my wife is, i let her know ahead of time my wife is going to be here because number one yes i may be a spiritual guide for you but there are things that as a woman she's going to understand and know better and so us together is going to be a greater asset yeah. to you than me or right. just her so we work together on all of our stuff wow that's neat that's neat so lauren will stay in the visit too for, mm-hmm. for that's great yep that's great Yep, yep. Any other questions or uh, comments anybody wants to make? I just want, would you let us copy that? Like if I came in one day? 
Sure. Oh, absolutely. Please feel free. Yeah. Sheila's going to do it. Yeah. No, Sheila cannot do it. Yes, I can. Isabella will get it for you. I'm just going to go to Kinko's and pay for it. That's what I would do. That you can print color here and not have to. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I could print out however many. Like, I got the PDFs. But it's the assembling. It's assembling and punching and then putting oh, yeah, the, the tabs, you know, and then right. even the tabs don't come one, two, three. It's like I got ten one tabs, ten two, you know what I mean? So you have to like, you, it takes, it's a putz work. It's a, it takes a, but, uh, so but yeah, can, you're definitely you welcome. Do it, do it. What? Show me how to work it. here now. What's that? <laughs> show me how to work it. I don't know, I know I work here. my printers, but yeah. every printer has its own mind. So yeah, it's true. Is printer we brought from uh, our building or is it? Yeah, okay. yeah, the one I use at least for color. Okay. I can help. Okay. I can, so I don't know if you're around um, I think it either tomorrow afternoon or Thursday or Friday. I'm here all week. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep. So um, that would be great. Okay. And, and then we'll see how many copies. One, two, three, four, five. However many you want to make. Don't burden yourself. You make, you make it. 72, so make 72. <laughs> You'll be here till you'll be here till 2022. Uh, the the Saturday has like two or three, two or three. Well, Mike straddles, so. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, yeah, you're welcome to bounce. I should have made that clear. People have been. Seven thirty to ten thirty. It's morning. Saturday is morning. Yeah, it's, yeah. But. Uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. Getting every last minute they can. Well, okay, any, any other questions that want to stifle? Well, great. Well, you guys have been a great um, group and uh, appreciate the input. Man, um, I wish I could do the recordings from like both and then like mix them because the input that people give adds so much to the lesson, you know, it could splice them all together. Yeah. But um, yeah, we'll, uh, that's my favorite session. The vine is the centerpiece there. That's all. Not, it's not more complicated than that. It's really not. So, well, let me uh, pray for us and wish you a great, wish you a great night. Let's pray, Father. We want to uh, give thanks to you so much. It's almost, it's almost overwhelmingly delightful how simple the principles are for shepherding people. God, uh, if they'll stay in touch with you, let their word, your word, stay in touch with them and obey. I'm just so grateful, Lord. Uh, I've studied so much, and you know, if it was complicated, we'd have to study it and figure it out. And but I'm just so grateful that it's simple, and I'm sure you did that on purpose. And so I just want to give thanks to you for that. And we want to ask that you would uh, lock in the things that we've learned. It's late, and our brains are tired, but lock in those uh, the simplicity of it in our hearts and in our minds, and um, assist us to stay close to you ourselves, and to walk underneath your shepherding care of us this this week. And Lord, to that end, I want to ask that you would give good rest to each one of these men and women as they go home, to families or to quiet homes. Lord, would you give sweet, uh, renewing rest to, to each one here? And even to Matt and to Mike and uh, Christian and the others that, that aren't here tonight. Uh, Lord, we, we thank you for hearing. And we uh, thank you for the help you gave us tonight. We praise you in your Son, our Master Jesus' name. Amen. Have a great night. Great night.